to a conversation on spasticity and treatment and examination ideas um, as part of the um, answering some of the questions um, as part of the stroke corner and conversations through the ANPT um, and the stroke SIG. Uh, Dr. Lynn Johnson and myself, um, uh, Dr. Rachel Studer Burns, will be having a conversation and go through some different videos and things to um, hopefully shed some light on spasticity and treatment ideas moving forward. All right, so then we get to do what we all love to do is look at it and gay, right? <laughs> Yeah, so we can watch him move. This is a patient who has had a stroke. We can see there's a lot going on. He's even got that little tremor as he picks his leg up. I'm watching him sit back down. This one's get all kinds of information from that, but kind of going through looking at common gait abnormalities post stroke. I broke it down to some different parts of, of the um, gait cycle. But at the end of the day, we're really just looking, is there limited dorsiflexion, limited knee flexion, limited hip extension or flexion, um, and even limited plantar flexion. Anything that's gonna show us that there is something that's kind of stopping that motion. And then kind of going back to what we talked about in terms of is it hypertonicity? Is it weakness? Um, I mean, is it just lack of range of motion? So if you're seeing these things in gait, you know, that doesn't necessarily mean there's, you know, plantar flexion spasticity. There's a lot of other reasons that it could be happening. So kind of watching through the different motions. I mean, are they picking their toes up and swing, but then as soon as their foot hits the ground, they're kind of pushed into that plantar flexion. Those are the, like the differences between hypertonicity, weakness, and spasticity, you can kind of pay attention for. So if we want to look back at the gate. We can kind of talk through some of those. Yeah, when I see, when I see him move, you know, you just kind of see those holding positions. Mm -hmm. And it really makes me, you see his foot go a little bit there with the, a little bit of the, the clonus. Mm-hmm. But there's not really any movement at the hip. And not much at the knee either. No, I mean, so, you know, a lot of it makes me wonder too, you know, they, they get so tight that they can't even really access their muscles. So, you know, is it, you know, if you were to bend his knee, you know, could he even, how much, how much range of motion would he even have, you know? Well, especially him. I mean, I feel like most people... They might look like that when walking, but then they go to sit and they can get to that 90 degrees, but he even sits sideways because his leg is so stuck in that extension. Yeah. And it, it also makes me wonder, you know, kind of like his sensory perception. You could kind of see the way he was holding this cane out to the side. You know, he, he's not really, I don't know how much his midline looks like everybody else's or if there's any kind of vision stuff kind of going on there too. So, so kind of just going through some of the other outcome measures you can use. I mean, obviously the modified Ashworth scale is going to give you a, an objective number that looks specifically at spasticity, but using some of these other, the, you know, the core outcome measures that I think are really important post-stroke are going to be things like the Berg balance scale, the FGA, the 10 meter walk test. And throughout all of those, if you can complete those, you can also look for spasticity. Um, one that's mostly used in research is the Fugelmeyer. Um, but I think it's important to kind of mention because it does use specific manual muscle testing versus those like gross motor patterns, which I think can really help us to see that difference between is it actually spasticity or is it that synergy or co-contraction happening? Can they access that specific movement versus, you know, 
is it just that greater motion that's caught given the trouble? And then like you've been talking about, sensation is so important when it comes to, I mean, any of this, that testing reflexes, testing proprioception, just testing sensation in general. And yeah, I think that co-contraction is really important to look at too, like you're saying. That's, I think that helps a lot. And then the coordination. I mean, even if it's not co-contraction, can they just coordinate to get specific movements that you're going for? I know we kind of hit on all of these. You've hit on all these, but just at the end of your evaluation, you want to make sure you're not just writing the word spasticity because they have that tone. You know, what else can we call it? Is it is it synergy or posturing? Is it a different movement dysfunction? Is it lack of coordination? Is it co-contraction? Or is it just that fractionation and isolated movements? So kind of coming back to what other words could we put in our documentation that are a little bit more descriptive of what, what is actually happening? So <clears throat> after you decide if it's really spasticity, the next question you really want to ask yourself is, do you really need to treat spasticity or do you just need to get the patient moving more effortlessly and efficiently? So identify what it is that you're treating. Try to, uh, try to separate that. Um, secondly, go through and try to identify what is it truly that your, that your goal and your patient's goal is. Is it endurance, strength, just getting back into the community? Overall, the take home is, is that we can't treat spasticity. We want to. We want to be able to treat the spasticity. We want to be able to, to make that improvement for our patient, but there really isn't a single current evidence-based treatment. What we can do, though, is to focus on the components of the activity, the goal of the patient. Um, we can also really look at um, how can we just get the patient moving? Um, if the patient's moving in these synergistic patterns, if the patient's moving with these, spas these spasticity identified, identified um, positions, are there other things that we can do? Try to get them standing, get them into weight bearing, um, do our best to really try to promote these, these motions in activity through task practice. Um, overall, really consider increasing the intensity to encourage the ability for them to, to have muscle activation to improve um, their ability to just move and negotiate their, their environment um, and their, their current activities. Overall, remember that the exercise guidelines post-stroke are still appropriate for our patients who have um, issues with spasticity, um, abnormal tone, who have synergies, um, or who are having difficulty with muscle activation. Overall, really look at the aerobic recommendations and the resistance recommendations. Most of our patients aren't moving um, to, meet these, um, to meet these guidelines. Um, and if their overall endurance improves, their overall capacity, um, oftentimes you'll see um, the limiters of spasticity and tone um, decrease because they're able to move a little bit easier. We all know that, you know, as far as treating spasticity goes, most of the research, you know, kind of pushes us towards, you know, pharmacological intervention as far as Botox, Baclofen, um, Dantrolene. Um, I think it's used some, probably a little bit less now, um, more in those larger muscles. You know, making sure too, that if we know our patients are going in for Botox, that we're jumping in there to be a part of the treatment plan. Um, you know, I think that we, I think there's enough research at this point that shows that, you know, Botox on its own is not gonna solve a problem. Um, you know, we need to be able to jump in and teach them how to use that new range of motion that they have. Um, and, um, and so advocating for that with your, um, with the physicians is really important. We also know, you know, historically, there's been a ton of like mechanical management using splints and ankle casting and things like that. And, and we know that in general, there's relatively poor compliance um, and utilizing a lot of these. Um, they're hot. And they're, you know, being down here in Florida, our patients are like, yeah, I'm not wearing that stuff. I'm sweating to death anyway, you know, so that, you know, like the resting hand splints that we see a lot, you know, there's not a lot of evidence that supports that it actually improves the contractures or that it stops them from forming. There's more and more research coming out now about using e-stim, um, even kind of looking more into like that VR situation, you know, put them in p positions where they have to try to access different pathways. You know, for spasticity, these kinds of things aren't necessarily recommended, but again, is the problem muscle activation? Is it that they're co-contracting and what we're trying to do is to break up and, and provide an inhibitory event so that they can start to access more of these coordinated movements um, to be able to break up and fractionate. It goes back to what you're saying as far as like trying to make sure that we're 
we're looking at all those things in our in our evaluation. Also, that you know, task task specific training, you know, it goes back and forth. There's been a ton of research that shows that if you practice the same thing over and over and over again, sometimes it gets better and sometimes it doesn't. You know, maybe it's looking more specifically at the task that we're asking them to do. So, you know, there's more emerging research on backward walking um, as far as really trying to kind of break up some of these motor patterns and teach knee flexion to teach, you know, plantar flexion, dorsiflexion to, to change, to check, teach these reciprocal movements um, that, you know, again, you know, put them on different surfaces and things like that as far as um, accessing these different coordinated movements. And then, of course, just remembering that if there is a sensory and component involved here, that it takes a long time for that adaptation to occur. Unfortunately, they learn these patterns really early, and then it takes us the rest of our lives to undo these patterns that they learn. So um, uh, just kind of being aware of, of that, like kind of motor adaptation timeline that it, um, it requires work. Um, and so making sure that we're having that heart to heart with our patients, that this isn't something that's going to fix overnight. You know, this is something that we have to kind of both dive into and work pretty hard together on. Well, hey, Lynn, thanks for having a conversation with me today about spasticity. Um, hopefully it's helped us both and we'll, we'll grow in our, our treatment. Yeah, definitely. Um, I feel like I learned a lot just by trying to kind of prepare for having the discussion. Um, and hopefully this is helpful for everybody else. Um, don't forget that we do have a question box on the student corner page. Um, so if you have questions either about spasticity or about anything else, you can kind of drop those in, send them to us and we can try and make more videos and help out. Thank you.